Welcome back. The Supreme Court ruled against the state of Indiana and for a criminal defendant in Timms v. Indiana, an asset forfeiture case. This is a very important case, one of the most important in the last couple of years. My name is Patrick Nolan. I'm an attorney licensed in the state of Missouri. This is Pat Talks Law. Tyson Timms pleaded guilty in Indiana State Court to dealing in a controlled substance conspiracy to commit theft. At the time of his arrest, the police seized a Land Rover SUV that Timms had purchased for $42,000. And that money he had received from an insurance policy when his father died. The state sought civil forfeiture of his vehicle. And they were charging that the SUV had been used to transport heroin. Now, observing that Tim's had recently purchased a vehicle for more than four times the maximum $10,000 monetary fine accessible against him for his conviction under Indiana law, the trial court denied the state's request. The vehicle's forfeiture, the court determined, would be grossly disproportionate to the gravity of Tim's offense and therefore unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment's Excessive Fines Clause. The Court of Appeals of Indiana affirmed that decision. However, the Indiana Supreme Court reversed it, holding that the Excessive Fines Clause constrains only federal action and is inapplicable to state impositions. Now, when ratified in 1791, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government. Okay. A Bill of Rights protection is incorporated to the states if it is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty or deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. And those are quotes from very important cases. Strangely, the state of Indiana argued that the clause did not apply to its use of civil in rem forfeitures. But the Supreme Court held in Austin, the United States, it's 509 U.S. 602, that such forfeitures fall within the clause's protection when they are at least partially punitive. In the Timms case, the forfeiture was punitive. Indiana could not have prevailed unless the Supreme Court overruled its previous Austin decision or held that in light of Austin, the excessive fines clause is not incorporated to the states because its application to civil and rem forfeitures is neither fundamental nor deeply rooted. Now, there's a, a big flaw with that, and of course, the court held differently, you know, serving up a unanimous verdict that the excessive fines clause is incorporated to the states. Now, the state of Indiana has a maximum monetary fine of $10,000 for the charges for which Tims was convicted. Seizing his Land Rover, the $42,000 vehicle, far exceeded the maximum fine under Indiana law. Every state may have a different maximum fine. But the history of fundamental and deep-rooted, going back to the history of that clause, excessive fines clause traces its lineage back to at least 1215 A.D. when the Magna Carta guaranteed that a free man shall not be immersed for a small fault, but after the manner of the fault, and for a great fault, after the greatness thereof, saving him, saving to him, his contentment. As relevant here, the Magna Carta required that economic sanctions be proportioned to the wrong and not be so large as to deprive an offender of his livelihood. And it makes sense to scrutinize state action more closely when the state stands to benefit. Justice Scalia wrote that. I love his opinions. In short, the historical and logical case for concluding that the 14th Amendment incorporates the excessive fines clause is overwhelming. Protection against excessive punishment, or excuse me, protection against excessive punitive economic sanctions secured by the clause is, to repeat, both fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty and deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. Unanimously. Now the court did pointedly deny Indiana the opportunity to expand the issue from punitive measures to purely civil and rem actions by declining to overturn Austin. 
There may be a source of future litigation in that, as more civil asset forfeiture is challenged. Now remember, in this case, Tim's was charged, pleaded, and was ultimately sentenced. The next question will be whether or not this also applies in a pure civil matter, where no arrest was made and when no convictions were filed. There are many civil asset forfeitures in that realm. I'm going to post a link to the opinion and to the analysis on the SCOTUS blog, which has an excellent review of this. Please comment below and let me know what you think. Should a convicted drug dealer be subject to the loss of all of their property that may be connected to the crime, no matter how tangentially? Or should the police be able to seize anyone's property anytime and force you to prove that you did not come by that property in an illicit manner. Manner. Anyway, please like and subscribe. Hit the alert bell. I've got a feeling the debate on this is going to be lively. You're probably going to want to catch it. Thank you.